So my first advice would be don't get discouraged if you don't make it on the first attempt. If you try to analyze your mistakes or shortcomings from the first attempt and you try to correct them, take feedback if possible from the recruiter or from your friends and then try to improvise on that. Hey, my name is Felix Tia. I'm the host of The Culture of Code, where we bring on experienced software engineers, engineering managers, product managers, designers, anyone that works in tech to talk about their tech career and what has worked and what hasn't worked for them to get to where they are today. In this episode, I am joined by Vanit Jogokar, engineering manager at Google. Prior to Google, he worked at Bloomberg and Amazon. In Amazon, he managed teams that built and supported tools for creators to create live streams and enhance Amazon Live's homepage. Welcome, Vanit. Thank you, Felix. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm glad that, to have you on here. So you had a wonderful career starting with lots of different things you were doing, but I want to sp speak specifically to your kind of your first long stretch of a time at Bloomberg where you were there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned to us that around eight year mark, you eventually transitioned from, I guess, an IC to more of like a team lead role. Can you tell us more about that that transition? Like what changes when you step into a, a team lead or a kind of a tech lead, some kind of the lead role from a, like a technical perspective? Sure. So team lead is more like an entry-level manager. However, at Bloomberg, they're also expected to be very hands-on. So probably a little less hands-on than the senior engineer would be, but still pretty much uh, in touch with actual coding part, design part, making sure that the system architecture is, is proper, etc. And in addition to that, managerial responsibilities, such as making sure that the team is well taken care of or stakeholder management, also a little bit visionary stuff about the roadmap, what needs to be built and whatever we have, is that in line with the broader organization goal, et cetera. So I would say management stuff, but also very technical, close to what the senior engineers are expected to do anyways. Yeah, how would you say that your role changes in regards to, let's say someone is really interested in just kind of hands-on keyboard, they enjoy coding, it sounds like a team leader, tech lead role will start to kind of eat into that a bit where now you have new responsibilities, which might mean that you don't have as much time to, to write code. Is that the case or like, do you find that you still find room for that? How much time you still get to spend on coding if that's like your passion? Yeah, so it might depend on the team size. So if you have a small team, let's say four or five engineers, then you can find time to do hands-on coding as well. But if you if you are owning a larger team or if you're owning multiple initiatives, and even if you don't have multiple managers reporting to you, your team is divided in a way that there are multiple different priorities or multiple different charters are being handled under your ownership, then I would say the hands-on part would get a little less because as a team lead, your primary responsibility is management. And then who is also expected to be like well versed in system design and coding etc but coding is not the primary responsibility because you need to make sure that you are the force multiplier right like you are not the only one delivering everything so how do you make sure that you do that effectively by empowering your team by handling and managing uh, uh, and working effectively with your stakeholders and cross team collaboration so if you want to do that effectively you would obviously will have to spend a little less time on coding unless you want to burn yourself out which i would not recommend so now, now that you see you're in a kind of a full blown like engineering management uh, role at Google and also your experience at, at Amazon as well, what about that kind of step from a like tech lead, team lead to engineering manager? Like how much does your responsibility shift once you transition to that role? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually a quite natural transition. It's more about the, the tech lead or team lead at Bloomberg being the entry level manager. So they won't expect you to have a vision for, let's say five year vision for the org or how or how your charter, or whatever you're working on that fits into the organizational perspective, et cetera. Or in other words, it is like level difference. So an L5 level manager at let's say Amazon or Google versus L6 level manager at Amazon, Google, it is that kind of separation. So the, the expectations are similar. You're still expected to take care of your team, work, with, work effectively with stakeholders. The vision aspect gets little broader, meaning that you are now owning more things than what you would as a team lead, or you are expected to think a little beyond like just a year or so, and then kind of influence other people in terms of how do you kind of not just craft your own roadmap, but also get buy-in from other stakeholders to kind of have the org level alignment. So that's basically the, the next level expectation from like engineering manager versus what you would have as a team lead or tech lead. 
Yeah, so it sounds like a team lead is almost like a great kind of transition or almost like a dip your toes in the water to see if you want to get into management, like, like full-blown management like, like you're doing now. Do you think that that's enough or are there still certain aspects of being a team lead that doesn't fully give you insight into what it's like, what kind of responsibilities you have as a manager? Is there something that's just like not available at a team lead or is an engineering manager just like the team lead but a lot more of that same type of work? Yeah, that may vary from company to company, but at least the experience I've had at Bloomberg or even at Amazon and uh, Google, where the equivalent of team lead or tech lead would be the L5 level manager. So usually ICs who are at L5 level, if they want to transition into management, that is what they do. They transition as L5 level manager, which is very similar to what I explained from a team lead at Bloomberg. So you're absolutely right. This is the way if they want to get uh, a hang of uh, how management looks like and whether they are interested in that. You can do that while being an IC as well, up to a certain limit, meaning that working with stakeholders or contributing to roadmap, et cetera, what you may not have access to is the actual team management, meaning the performance evaluation of your reports, because you may not have direct reports at that time. And then for confidentiality and other legal reasons, like you may not be able to see their past performance, you can still have an influence in terms of feedback for their future performance reviews, but uh, that is the separation I would say between formally transitioning into the management or, or team lead role versus being an IC and still kind of get the flavor or get an idea of what is what would be expected from you when you become a team lead. Just a slight correction, I may have misspoken. So team lead would still have the formal input over the performance management. I was talking about the senior engineer who can still act as a manager in terms of roadmap or, or vision, but who does not formally transition into team lead aspect will be missing of like actual doing people management part because they will they will not have reports if they are still acting as an IC but want to take a taste of being an what else would it need they or they would need to have to act like an engineering manager so as a team lead you still have reports or at least in, in Bloomberg or Google and Amazon the L5 managers do have reports and have control over the the performance evaluation of, of their reports so uh, sorry if I misspoke that earlier yeah, that's a good point about how when you are a team that you have some input and some influence on a, a member of your team's like career and how they're performing. But then as an engineering manager, you have formal kind of a relationship where you have much more say in their performance, much more say in their career. And that's like a lot of responsibility to take into your hands. When you transition to that world, how are you able to kind of adapt, especially for someone that's like thinking about becoming manager that's listening and now they have this new responsibility of having to take this kind of ownership and it's a lot of responsibility. How did you handle it? Like what are kind of some advice or tips that you have for any, anyone else that might be a first time manager? Yeah, I think it is particularly tricky if you are transitioning into the same team and now the people who used to be your peers now report to you, right? In that case, like having that dynamic is, uh, is challenging. And I think what can help you is before even you get to that stage, having a really good relationship with your teammates and earning their trust is, is very important because that helps you tremendously when you become their manager, they already know what kind of person you are. And if they feel that no matter whether you are the manager or peer, you have good intentions and you would be supportive, uh, that plays a huge role. Uh, another thing that helps is being kind of like a role model in many different uh, areas, right? Like it be technical expertise or influencing in, in other ways, then they can see that as a natural transition. Because if they already look up to you as a technical expert in that field, then they may not feel that, hey, why this person is becoming the manager when other people are more technically capable th than them. So having that solid understanding of the tech stack, having technical other like language or other tech stack expertise and influencing and earning their trust will help you kind of naturally go into that transition. I don't mean that it is easy, but that is something that you could do as a homework or before you actually get to that particular level so that your transition becomes easier. Not necessarily easy, but uh, I think everything has some challenges associated with that. Yeah, that's a good point about how when you are transitioning into a people management responsibility or role, if it's on the same team, it's almost like harder than if it's a brand new team that they have no expectations or they have no current relationship with you. But if they do have current relationships with you, then you have to have earned that trust and, and almost feel like uh, you're an obvious choice maybe for the team before that transition happens. Yeah, and that's where I think soft skills are so important, right? Like whenever I talk to people earlier in their career, I usually try to highlight that 
hard skills are great, but soft skills become more and more important as you grow in your career. Earning trust is a prime example. Like, unless you have good soft skills, it is just based on your technical abilities. It is not that easy to earn your teammates trust. Yeah, let's talk about that. Cause I think that it's, as you mentioned, that this is not something they teach you, get your CS degree, how to develop these kinds of soft skills to earn trust. What does that mean to you to earn someone's trust? I think what ways have you found to be the most useful to, to earn the trust of your, your colleagues? Yeah, there is no one right answer that, okay, do this and you will be able to earn, earn trust. Like there are multiple various aspects that you have to keep in mind, right? And that's why I think Communication in general is such a broad umbrella, but uh, that is what plays a big role in earning trust, in my opinion. So one of the most important things is uh, your listening skills, like how you behave with them during meetings. Are you combative or are you taking into consideration what their opinion is? No matter whose opinion is, how you present your ideas, how you receive other people's ideas, and how you engage in constructive dialogues, so not attacking anybody, but uh, kind of keeping people aside and trying to solve problem. Like that is a really important skill to have. And listening plays a huge role in that because if you practice active listening, meaning that listen to understand or not to respond, meaning that sometimes you get this, even like even I do, or most of us do many times that as somebody is talking, you already start constructing answers in your head, like because you want to reply or you want to respond to them. But if you take a moment and first just try to understand what they're saying and analyze, okay, what could be the intention or what do exactly they mean? And then try to respond to that question. That makes a huge difference because in that case, you actually listen to everything that they said, like not half listen and half trying to construct the response in your head. And it may sound a small thing, but it plays a big role because your response also changes based on that, right? Now you're not just half listening and responding, but you're actually trying to understand and creating appropriate response. And then another thing is being open about feedback. Like you should be giving timely and actionable feedback, but at the same time, you should also be willing to receive feedback. And if people are not giving you the feedback proactively, then you should be proactively seeking that feedback. That kind of helps them also on the trust saying that, hey, this person is actually giving me feedback that helps me. And on top of that, they are also interested in hearing from me. And that's how you kind of build the constructive relationship. And trust is like the foundation of that. So these are two main things, in my opinion. And in addition to the technical part that I'm saying, like, like you may have great soft skills, but if you are not technically savvy, or if you don't know what your tech stack is, then just the soft skills is not going to help because then they say, okay, yeah, he's a good communicator, but he doesn't understand the system. So how can I trust him? So technical skills is like the table stakes, like it's expected. But on top of that, like practicing active listening, seeking and giving feedback, and just in general, like working with humans. For coding, you work with computers all the time, but your team is like full with humans. So how do you kind of go just beyond just business and build relationship, talk about their interest, share your expertise, sometimes be vulnerable, right? Like if you face certain challenges and share that with the team in not to kind of gain sympathy, but to kind of share your knowledge or experience with them with the hope that that will help them in some way, that also helps in building trust. So these are some of the things that, that I practice myself and something that I feel that if everybody follows at least partly uh, all of these things that will help them tremendously in earning trust. Yeah, I think one of the things about earning trust is that the higher kind of levels you go, the more of these meetings that let's say that you're part of, or like let's say councils that you're part of where you're making a decision, there's going to be people that leave that meeting disappointed that maybe the, their idea, their approach wasn't the one that was chosen. How do you reconcile that where there are decisions that you might be making that are going to disappoint people or at least, I guess the right words were disappoint, disappoint people, but then also not hurt their trust in you at the same time? Like, do you see that those are like opposites of each other or are they related to each other? How do you see like the, the difference between like trust and like disappointing people when you have to say no or disagree with their ideas or their approaches? Yeah, great question. Actually, earning trust does not mean doing everything that they want or saying yes to everything that people expect you to say yes to, anything on those lines. So building trust is basically making sure that you convey that whatever you're doing, you're doing with sincerity and you explain the why behind that. Meaning that in terms of, let's say, your example of giving prioritization or somebody is presenting some idea and that does not get prioritized, right? Explaining the why behind that, what decisions went into deciding what gets prioritized and what does not. 
and backing that up with data or whatever reasons you may have, right? It also happens in promotion, right? Like you have good relation with your teammates, doesn't always mean you get to promote everybody every single cycle, right? So understanding basically their motivations and then explaining that how you have tried everything you could, but these are the gaps that you observe and unless they work on that, it would be very difficult to kind of make that case for promotion. So explaining what is the, the gap is and also explaining how you are supporting them in kind of bridge that gap, gap. Once they see that, that, okay, I understand what the gap is. And also I see that my manager is trying to create opportunities that will help me fill that gap. That will help them overcome that kind of block that, hey, I trust this person, but they're not helping with the promotion. Like that kind of feeling won't happen. And uh, both these things are examples, but there could be other situations where uh, there are two developers on your team and they cannot come to an agreement. And if you pick side of one person, then other person may feel that, okay, like, is this favoritism or something like that? But uh, what I said in my first answer about like explaining the why behind that, or rather than giving your input or saying that this is what we are doing, framing that in a way that you are asking questions and then somehow leading them to kind of that consensus could be one strategy to kind of earn their trust so that you are not saying that, oh, this should be done, but you are kind of questioning them to come to that answer so that they themselves may feel that, okay, like, okay, this, given the circumstances, given the constraints, this seems like the right decision because every experienced person, engineer would know that, okay, there are always trade-offs, right? Like there is no one system that will handle everything. So similarly over here, like you're talking about trade-offs, like, okay, why this uh, decision makes sense right now and what needs to be uh, reprioritized. So overall, these approaches, I would say, help in kind of maintaining that trust, even though you are kind of either saying no to their promotion or kind of not prioritizing uh, their ideas. I think it makes me feel like it's very similar to your earlier point about active listening, where rather than making a decision about what you want to say already and then just waiting for your turn, similarly, where you aren't actively just making a decision and then kind of top down telling them what to do, you are going through this like journey with them to arrive at a conclusion, which might change your original I guess, preconceived conclusion by you going through this exercise as well. Do you find that it happens or do you usually find that what you believe it usually ends up being the right approach after you go through this journey with them where you, you know, ask a series of questions to get them to arrive at a conclusion? No, you said it perfectly well, right? It's not always like just because you are the manager doesn't mean you're always going to be right. Everybody's a human. Like we all tend to make mistakes. But as you said, look, if you are with them on this journey and if you are practicing this active listening or being sincere about exploring options, then you can correct yourself and you can also change the course. And uh, if you do that, that is also another uh, good thing that you brought up that will help uh, earn trust, right? Because then they will see that it's not just you are telling them what to do, but you are also like with them on this journey and you are willing to change your mind and value their opinion more than your original beliefs. Yeah. And one thing you said too was about how feedback is super important, being able to give timely feedback and then also to be open to feedback. Have you ever been in an environment where feedback doesn't feel safe to give or to ask for? And if so, like, why do you think that this happens? Like, how do you remedy that in that kind of environment? Yeah. I mean, ideally it should not happen. It has not happened with me yet. Uh, I was always able to speak my mind. And uh, but also it, it might depend on how you phrase it, right? Like if you are giving feedback to somebody and if you're being a jerk about it, then obviously like the other person is also human. So even if they don't want to, they might kind of hold that against you to a certain limit, maybe not to, to a large extent. So I think how you phrase that would probably make a big difference. This totally depends on the organization culture, right? Like if they're only saying that, hey, this is a safe space, say whatever you want, but then they are doing things which don't really align with that then your sincerity is not going to make much difference because they would know that, okay, my manager is being sincere, but overall, this is not the organization's culture, so that's not going to work. So I would say uh, I'm fortunate to have worked at companies where it was actually possible to give honest feedback. But in that, I would still say play safe and frame it in a way that you are talking about the problem and not a person, right? Because if you say that, hey, you didn't do this, then naturally that human is going to feel attacked to a certain level and then their response would be slightly different. But if you focus on a problem and explain the impact on why this was not the right decision or why it affected you negatively, uh, that lands much better than directly like saying something to the person. And then after Bloomberg, you went to ShopBop, which was a subsidiary of Amazon, then also spent some time over at Amazon. What was that experience like, I think, working at a subsidiary and then eventually transitioning to a parent company? Did you find that that was like a very smooth transition or what was that like? It was a very smooth transition because ShopBop, even though it's a subsidiary, like 
everything is Amazon, meaning that their leadership principles are followed, internal tech stack and all the processes, everything is Amazon. So that way it was not much difference. I think what was different was mainly the prioritization process because ShopBob operates independently. They have their own buying and planning and marketing and accounting departments. So their prioritization is much more kind of local to ShopBob only. Like there are fewer dependencies on Amazon. Of course, infrastructure wise, because we use Amazon, there would be dependencies on that, but still it was kind of local to ShopBob itself. When you go to Amazon, depending on again, which team you are in, that might change, but it, it's still sometimes like still within the same organization or something. Definitely you would feel that, oh, you have to communicate with 15 different teams, unless you are in like a super core infrastructure team that 15 other team, teams depend on, etc. But uh, yeah, fortunately the transition was very smooth. Even the location was the same. So that was not much different for me. And during this time too, you mentioned to us about how preparing to get into Google and the whole Google interview process has always been notoriously known as a very tough process or a very selective process. Um, any tips here on how folks that are interested in applying it to Google, how to prepare for and me specific, specifically what worked out for you? Yeah. First of all, it did not work out for me in my first attempt. So I actually cleared my interview in my second attempt. I also have a YouTube channel and uh, I've uploaded a video on that on my journey to Google. So if anybody's interested, they can take a look at it. So my first advice would be don't get discouraged if you don't make it on the first attempt. If you try to analyze your mistakes or shortcomings from the first attempt and you try to correct them, take feedback if possible from the recruiter or from your friends and then try to improvise on that, you may succeed on the second chance. And uh, fortunately, Google gives at least I would say three chances. Like, I, there's no official policy, I guess, or at least that I know of, but I, I know people who made it on their third attempt. So it's possible. So don't lose hope, give your best and, and prepare hard. Now coming to that preparation part, at least for software developers, they focus very heavily on data structures and algorithms. And then depending on level, system design may also come into picture. So uh, having good understanding of fundamentals like system design, data structures and algorithms, and coding practice, not just fundamentals in the theory perspective, but also like hands-on coding uh, wise would be absolute must. On top of that, again, depending on the level, soft skills become very important because you are interviewing for a particular level and then there are certain expectations from that level. So if you give in, in your behavioral interviews, if you give examples of things that are not in line with the expectations from that level, then even though your technical interviews were good, your behavioral interviews, you may not score as much. And then depending on the requirement, they may either down level you or flat out reject you because th there is no down level also possible for that particular role. So I would say focus not just on the technical aspects, but also on the behavioral aspects. If you have any friends at Google or, and this is applicable to any company, not just Google, but even for Amazon, try to understand the expectations from the level that you are applying for, and then make sure that you have enough data points and phrase those data points, like give those answers in a way that they sound that level appropriate. So these would be at least the high level tips that I would say. Yeah, and, and maybe at Google specifically, or just in general, if you are given the opportunity to interview at, let, let's say, like a level above where you're at, would you recommend always going for that, especially if there's an option to be down-leveled if you didn't, let's say, clear the bar for, for that higher level, or do you recommend playing it safer and going for interview at a level that's more, I guess, closer to where you're at today? So if you feel confident that even though you are not at the next level in your current company, but you are already doing that job and for whatever reasons you are not getting promoted, then I would say definitely apply for the next level because in that case, what you talk about is going to be natural, right? You won't have to kind of try to make up answers that kind of align with the next level, etc. And usually recruiters do a pretty good job in having some initial screening with you to kind of understand based on your experience, what level might be appropriate for you. So if they feel that you are actually better suitable for L6, but you want to apply for L7, can have a talk with you to understand more on why you want to apply and do you actually have that kind of experience. So I would say take recruiter's suggestions also and be confident in your own abilities on whether you actually already have demonstrated those in your current job, definitely go for the next level. But uh, yeah, you don't really have to play safe as such, but you don't have want to appear unprepared for the next level as well, right? Because that's probably not going to uh, create a good impression. So I would say understanding that role expectation and understanding how your experience kind of matches with that 
should help you decide whether to go for the next level or the same level. Now, I'll talk about your experience between Bloomberg, Amazon, and Google. Bloomberg being one of the oldest, I guess, let's say, tech companies that, that in this set and that probably exists right now, Amazon being a huge company as well, and obviously Google being a huge company too. I'm sure the cultures between these three different companies are very different. Can you talk to us about like what it's like, uh, differences between these three pretty large companies? Yeah. Bloomberg has changed quite a bit now. So whatever I say may not be actually true right now. I left Bloomberg in 2015. So a lot has changed since then. But when I was in Bloomberg, it was a tech company, but it was also serving financial industry, right? So they, it, it has kind of a hybrid culture of tech, but also at the uh, same time finance, meaning that some rigidness that comes with finance, like lack of uh, flexibility in terms of timing, etc., which changed dramatically over time. Even when I was there, like work from home was a little more accepted than that. I remember when I was just starting out in 2005, there was no concept of work from home at all. Like uh, even during snowstorms or whatnot, if you cannot make it to the office, then just take a day off rather than working from home. So it was that rigid. And I think because of the financial industry, financial industry was like that. So it, it changed significantly after that. Uh, also another big difference is Bloomberg has a lot of proprietary technology. They have their own flavor of database and uh, even their own uh, JavaScript based things that they use for UI. So a lot of hardcore, like low level stuff, which is proprietary. But even now I've seen, and from friends I hear, a uh, significant shift in open source or even using the latest technologies that are out there in the market. So a lot has changed, but uh, it was little less when I was there. That is very different compared to either Amazon or Google, right? Like they are like Amazon AWS, obviously, and even in Google, like their search or their cloud platforms are very different from the, the, having anything proprietary or there. And uh, in terms of culture wise or processes wise, I think also there is difference. Not so much between, I would say, Google and Amazon. There is slight difference in terms of uh, top down versus bottom up, meaning that in Amazon, it felt a little more top down, meaning that directors and above would make decisions on, okay, what should be the priorities for this year? And then you go and execute on that. That doesn't mean that developers don't have say in what needs to be done to, let's say, reduce tech debt or betterment of the tech stack, et cetera. But generally it would weigh more heavily on the top-down approach. Whereas in Google, it is slightly more bottoms up, meaning that developers are a lot more empowered to kind of whatever, like propose their different ideas, even though they were not originally considered from the top level thing. That doesn't mean that directions don't come from top level. There are obviously the directions are decided at high levels, but the actual projects or even large initiatives can come from developers. Bloomberg was a lot more top down, like product managers would decide understandably, like again, I'm not like hinting at it, whether this is good or that is good. It is what that company needs and what problem they are solving, right? Like they are obviously solving problems for financial clients. So obviously product managers would know more than the developers, but because of the proprietary technology side, that particular organization had a lot of say, and it was a lot more bottom up because if you are proposing some changes to the technology, then obviously like people would be receptive to those ideas. But in terms of percentage wise, I would say it was more top down than bottom up. And then in terms of customer also, that was another big difference. Like Bloomberg is B2B. So they don't usually, I mean, you have to be super wealthy to afford a Bloomberg terminal for an individual client, right? But usually hedge funds and investment banks, they are Bloomberg's main clients, buy side, sell side, both sides. Uh, but Amazon, it is more B2C. So you're directly interacting with the customer. The same is with Amazon. So in these two companies, that was a lot different than, than at Bloomberg. I think one important thing you talked about was like the top down versus kind of bottoms up cultures. How did you make that transition? What kind of advice do you have for people that make that transition where they come from much more of a top down engineering driven culture where the product managers are, are in control of the roadmap and lots of what the, the engineers work on are things off of the roadmap versus more kind of bottoms up ideas that are, let's say, like your experience at Google. When you come to a company where you are now not expected, but maybe more of the expectation is that a lot of the ideas should come from the engineers, the, the ICs. How do you make that transition? How do you recommend other people make that transition? It's your responsibility to make sure that your employees get the right opportunities and you give them the right feedback. And uh, the way these two are tied together is that in the bottom sub culture, like you need to give them feedback that, hey, 
you can make a difference. Like if you have an idea, then definitely suggest that. Or also work with them on their on understanding role guidelines, which kind of say what is expected from which level or which also say that what, what is needed to get to the next level and kind of tie that with their own ambitions or own goals. Like if you want to get promoted, this is what is expected from the next level. Or if you want to do a good job in your current level, then again, this is what is expected. So kind of highlighting what is expected from the role, uh, making sure that you also convey how that aligns or is in their best interest to get their buy-in is basically what I have tried and what I've, what has worked for me. But uh, the transition is hard, right? It's not that straightforward, it's especially for multiple years if you're uh, accustomed to just getting order. I mean, that's probably too harsh, but basically expecting that somebody's going to tell you what to do and you're going to execute on that, that mindset is definitely challenging. But kind of talking to other people who have been in that environment, understanding what worked for them, or if somebody else who has probably transitioned from another top-down company into this particular role, what helped them can help you get different perspectives in terms of, okay, this is something that worked for them. Could it work for me? Or is this something I should try? So making sure that you are actively trying to seek feedback, not just on your performance, but like understanding what worked for others and incorporate that in your own experience, making sure that you have open line of communication with your manager about what is expected from your role and are you actually doing that or not. And then as a manager, making sure that you are being very open and honest about what your support should do and then kind of help them sometimes even guide them, right? especially if they are a junior, then they may see what is expected, what is written as what is expected from them, but they may not know what exactly that means or what do they need to do to demonstrate that. So in that case, doing some handholding, giving them examples would be helpful. So these are some of the things that I've tried and worked so far, I guess, and I would, I would recommend the same. Yeah, I almost assume if that, the, or I almost feel like the top down to bottom up transition is harder than the other way around in terms of meeting the expectations. Maybe you feel uncomfortable either way or the other transition, but yeah, it sounds like one's much harder than the other. Uh, we, we talked about the difference between the big tech companies that you worked at. I'd love to learn more about the maybe misconceptions that you had before joining Bloomberg, Amazon, or Google, and that you recognize or misconceptions once you join and now are on the inside. Yeah, so for Bloomberg, I think the common misconception was that it's a finance company, right? And that is not true. Its clients are finance related, but it is very, very tech heavy company. So it's not like, okay, tech folks are treated as second class citizens and they don't have a say or anything like that, right? So that was the major misconception that was cleared after joining Bloomberg. Like developers have significant amount of like ownership. They are, they're also treated like a first class citizen. For Amazon, well, I don't know if it's a misconception, but at least what I did not experience is the uh, notorious burnout culture, right? Like, fortunately, I had very supportive managers, and even in, in ShopBob or in Amazon Live, work will vary, right? Like, yeah, there will be times when you have to spend a lot more time, but people are understanding, like, that it's not always going to be the case. There will be occasional ups and downs, and overall, people did give good support when needed and flexibility was there so uh, I, I would say like yes amazon gets a bad rep for that but my experience was not like that maybe it was localized for some particular orgs uh, within amazon but at least yeah, i would say my time at amazon was really good like management and all the stakeholders were very supportive and uh, with google i think uh, i don't think there's any misconception i guess right like that everything is like i'm very thankful to be here <laughs> and it's it's pretty good so far. Speaking of your Amazon and burnout, one thing that you like to do outside of work is that you're training for the New York City Triathlon. Tell us more about that experience, especially how do you balance your, your day job with training for something like so extensively? Yeah, so triathlon was a long time back. I did triathlon in 2014. And then in 2017, I did a half marathon. And very recently on April 23rd, I actually did my first full marathon. So uh, try to be active, but yeah, I mean, the theme is still the same, right? Like how to find time to do such things. I think one thing that helps in this particular case is the other side things that I'm trying are more physical related, right? It involves exercise. And that helps you a lot in managing your energy levels. So if you have a sedentary lifestyle, then your energy levels are gonna go down. So kind of trying something physical actually helps you being more productive at your work. That is, that is one of the reasons I kind of stuck to this. I won't say stuck to this, like it's not that I'm doing this every single year, but I've tried that. And it also helps indirectly in kind of challenging your own limitations, right? Like the reason I did triathlon because I thought that I would never do anything like that, right? Like I was not an athletic kid. And then I had those limiting beliefs. And then 
I saw my friends doing it and then I saw that okay they also don't look super athletic they could do it like why couldn't I and uh, I trained hard for that and I could do it in in the time that I actually wanted to finish it in and that changed quite a bit about how I look at myself right or overcoming those limiting beliefs and then in that triathlon my weakest point was running so then I said that okay can I challenge myself and then run a little farther so that's why I signed up for the half marathon not immediately it took me 3 years but but I did that so it doesn't like directly help you at your work but it once you start seeing results and once you start seeing that your limiting beliefs were just those like beliefs they were not facts that helps translate in your work as well right whatever limiting beliefs you may have at work that oh i'm never going to reach this level then you start challenging those as well that kind of actually happened with me for google as well like i never even imagined that i could get into google right so i never even tried and then as i saw success in in these fields i started challenging those beliefs as well saying that why am i saying without even trying that i can never make it right so these things indirectly help you so i would say they're not separate things that you actually have to find i mean yes practically you have to find time but it it is still kind of comes full circle and will help you in your in your daily routine and then how do you find time for that i think you have to be ruthless in terms of prioritization right like what do you have to work on and what do you don't have to work on like sometimes we do things just because oh i have time i will do this and uh, you tend to say yes to many things that you don't have to say yes to right so, so saying no more ruthlessly doing things only that kind of align with your goals which includes some like me time okay i'm not saying that you should always just do something and should not have any relaxing time because that that is equally helpful like you need to recharge your batteries as well but do that intentionally and uh, making sure that you also have realistic goals right like now i cannot do like at least at this moment say that okay go train for marathon and then next year train for ironman and then also try something else on the side start start a business that could become too much right so you know your limitations you know, make sure that you are setting realistic goal and have like a realistic timeline for that if i say that in a month i'm going to do everything then you're going to burn yourself out and then probably going to feel that okay no i'm, I'm not going to do this right so these are some of the tips uh, that that worked for me so i think hopefully they will work for others as well yeah that's a great uh, piece of advice to to end on i think it's uh, building that evidence that uh, you possess limiting beliefs and that you possess the ability to overcome them i think is such a transferable skill to from you know tr running triathlons and marathons or into the software engineering into your career to recognize that you probably possess limiting these limiting beliefs and that you can't overcome them so I appreciate that great advice and all the advice that you've given so far today thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience and advice with us Thank you, Felix. Thank you for the opportunity. I had a great time as well. And that's all the time we have for this episode. Come join us next time on the Culture of Code. Again, my name is Felix Tia. Take care.